So about two years ago, my friends and I decided to take a trip to California. Now, this is the way that trips work in our friend group, okay? Each person gets to pick one thing, one activity that they want to do, okay? And everybody submits an activity and we plan for those things. I've been to many, many bookstores because I live with a bookworm, but it's great. I enjoy doing trips this way. So the thing that I chose was gonna be a really big undertaking. So I paired up with a friend and we doubled our choice, okay? And we chose to go to Sequoia National Park. Now, if you have never been there, there's a lot of sequoia trees there. Did you know that? Fun fact, sequoia trees are the world's largest tree. The world's largest tree is the Sherman, General Sherman tree, which is a sequoia and it is 275 feet tall and over 36 feet wide at the base. This is not that tree, but it is a sequoia tree. Now, if you're like, Haley, why do we care about trees? Um, I care about trees because I grew up in western Oklahoma, and so trees are like a brand new concept to me. <laughs> also, like many of you, I enjoy being out in nature. Nature, it's, it's so easy to be in awe of what it is that God has created. Whenever I'm in nature, I'm reminded of the vastness of our planet and the interconnectedness of all of us. So in our scripture today, we're going to hear some words about nature. But it's potentially in a new context. The mountains in this text are being asked to be the judge in a lawsuit, okay? The imagery of the passage is that it's a court that's taking place. The people of Israel are on trial, and it's God who's taking them to court. I guess it would be difficult to find someone to judge if you were, uh, if you were Israel and God, who gets to be the judge of that. So God asked the mountains to judge for them. So it makes sense to me. The mountains have been there for a long time. So let's read. We are in Micah 6, and we will start with verse 1. Hear what the Lord is saying. Arise, lay out the lawsuit before the mountains. Let the hill hills hear your voice. Hear mountains, the lawsuit of the Lord. Hear the eternal fountains of the earth. The Lord has a lawsuit against his people. With Israel, he will argue. My people, what did I ever do to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam before you. My people remember what Moab and King Balak had planned and how Balaam, your son, answered him. Remember everything from Shittim to Gilad that you might learn to recognize the righteousness of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God, let the church say. In Micah and some of the other prophets, we say something that is a little bit unsettling. We see God angry. The chosen people of God have set up hierarchies within themselves. The poorest people are being treated terribly. And, Michael is, and Micah is so upset that people of God could act this way. He thinks that the people of God think they get a free pass because God, they're God's chosen people. They can do anything they want. And while an angry God is a little bit of an uncomfortable thought for us, would we want a God who's okay with people being abused? Would we want a God that says, yeah, that's cool if you treat people terribly? That's not the God that we worship. Our God is a God who's upset and sad whenever people are treated like they're disposable. God is sad whenever we live in communities where people don't have homes and don't have food to eat. I think that God is sad whenever another man is murdered in the street. Last week we talked about Dr. Lisa Miller and the week before that, we talked about her too. And last week specifically, we talked about her and her, how her and her colleagues have shown deep interconnectedness with one another, that we can tap into the interconnectedness and that we feel sadness 
whenever someone we love is sad, but we can translate comfort and care and love to them. God created us to be interconnected. That means that we're not whole until all people are treated like beloved children of God that they are. Back in the text, we'll start at verse 6. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings, with your old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with 10,000 rams or with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body, for the sins of my spirit? He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you. To do justice, to embrace faithful love, and to walk humbly with your God. The word of God for the people of God. Let the church say. In this courtroom, God brings the evidence against the people. He said, God says, we have a contract. I delivered you from slavery. I took care of you. I rescued you. And you are supposed to be devoted to me. Whenever God lays out, here is what has happened in the past. Here is how I've taken care of you. It seems to me that the people immediately get it. They concede and they say, of course God has rescued us. So what is our response? How do we respond to this incredible act? Do we give our time to God? Do we share with our neighbors? Do we give our money? Do we get, dedicate our lives to service? Do we buy a convertible and strap a bow on it and leave it in the parking lot at the church? They make this list and it, it gets larger and larger almost to the point of absurdity and God stops them. And God says, you already know what it is that you've been asked to give. You already know I've been teaching you this your whole lives. You're supposed to do justice and to share loving kindness and you're supposed to walk humbly with God. Justice can be described as doing things that prevent us from needing to engage in service projects. This is just a way that I like to think about justice. What if we didn't need to pack snack packs for homeless people because there were no more homeless people? What would it take to make that happen? The answer is a lot. The answer is that's a really big task and it's really complicated and there's a lot of stuff happening. And it's also true that that's what we're called to do. We're supposed to advocate for just systems. Loving kindness, if we help one another in a way that's performative or acting like we're better than other people, that's not really what God is asking us to do. The word here is hesed. Maybe you've heard of this kind of love, hesed love. It's a compassionate care for someone. God is asking us to not only do surface level acts for other people, but to connect and deeply care for those people in our lives. God also asks us to walk humbly. It's not a checklist and it's not something that we can get out of because we're chosen by God. That's our side of the deal. It's a continued relationship with God where we know what to do. We care for others and we serve others again and again. And it's not like it's a bad deal for us. Uh, in Dr. Miller's research, they took this broad group of people who have all different kinds of spirituality. Some people were just spiritual, some people were religious, and they were from different religious groups. And they polled them, and they tried to find unifying factors. What did these people have in common? So they came up with a list of things that the people have in common, and then they started identifying them. They started saying, okay, if people are altruistic, what does that mean? What effects do those things have in their lives? They found that people 
who are high in altruism and love are less depressed in years in the future than people who are less altruistic. And it has an even deeper effect if the person has previously experienced depression. It just seems that from a deep place of pain, sometimes we're compelled to serve one another, to join someone in their pain. And that turns out that it has mental health benefits for us. It also has spiritual benefits. There's uh, this movie, we were talking about movie, Kenzie and I were talking about movies earlier this week, and uh, I said one of my favorite movies is Peanut Butter Falcon. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, but there is a man who is in his early 20s, and he has Down syndrome. And there's no appropriate place for him to be. He needs full-time care, but the only place he can receive full-time care is in a nursing home. So it's just not a very good fit for him. So he escapes. He attempts to escape repeatedly. And one time he succeeds and he hides on the fishing boat of our friend named Tyler. Now Tyler is a delinquent person who likes to rob from other people. But through this interaction with Zach, he tries to find out what is it, where is Zach trying to escape to? Where does he want to go? Zach is a gigantic fan of a wrestler and he wants to go to his wrestling camp. That's his dream, is to be a professional wrestler. And instead of telling Zach that his dream is silly or it's not worthwhile, Tyler loves him. And he cares about his dream. And they work together for that dream. Tyler helps Zach go on the hero's journey that Zach deserves to have. Not everybody is automatically given the same opportunities, but when we partner together, we can give more people opportunities. Let us walk humbly with those who need our compassion. Amen. <laughs>